Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Welcome back to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with me, Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, for the past 11 weeks, Irish entrepreneur Pamela Laird has been impressing Lord Sugar and the viewers of the latest series of The Apprentice with her business acumen. Last week, Pamela left the process, finishing in third place, but she joins me now to discuss her experience on the hit TV show and her plans for her business, Moxie Loves. Pamela, congratulations on finishing in third place on this year's series of The Apprentice. But before we discuss this experience, did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Good morning, Carl. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to have made it uh, that far. And I guess it's a funny one because my parents were both, and um, they both had their own businesses. My dad was in the motor trade and my mum had a beauty salon. And I would always go to either one of their works after school and, you know, kill a few hours. And I think it was really clear from um, an early age that I definitely preferred going to the salon instead of the car garage. <laughs> um, and it's an interesting one because my mum reminds me of a time where I think I was nine when there was an opportunity for you to kind of get in your own makeup range as a salon and put your own brand on it. So she allowed me to take the reins and call it Pam's Kisses, which is a little bit embarrassing now. <laughs> but I think it definitely shows that I probably had a bit of a, a, a like for products and a, and a like for kind of doing my own thing. So this is kind of a range curated by me, if you like, from a catalog. So it wasn't like from scratch. But definitely, I think that entrepreneurial gene is probably in me from, from having both parents be, be their own bosses. So on the topic of beauty, talk to us about the early origins of Moxie Loves. Yeah, so early days, it really started with, I'm kind of my, so my second background after beauty is I worked a lot on behind the scenes of photo shoots. So I was a nail technician that would do cover shoots and editorials for most of Ireland's magazines. And I really just noticed that there were some products that potentially, or some tricks or hacks that makeup artists had behind the scenes that maybe my friends or you know other people that I knew not in the industry weren't really aware of I thought wow what if I created a range of between my experience in a beauty salon these professionals and and what I see kind of done behind the scenes and brought that to products and what would I do and so definitely the one thing I noticed was products that uh, correct mistakes because you know even professionals make mistakes and it's about how we correct them I suppose in the most efficient way so our first product was a liquid filled cotton bud and that really came from watching makeup artists use cotton buds and eye cleanser and the old fashioned way they would dip it in or they'd pour it and it was quite cumbersome messy and time consuming so I looked at well what if we pre-filled a cotton bud with liquid and we had like a click to release uh, mechanism which kind of pushed it down to the tip so it was moist and ready to go and then each bud is individually wrapped so perfect for our makeup artist hygiene and travel and so it sort of ticked all the boxes really and that's what we started with now during the famous interviews on last week's apprentice it came to light that due to new european laws you had to discontinue some of the moxie loves range can you tell us yes. about this development and the impact which it had on the business absolutely i mean it had a huge impact and i think it was both a business lesson and, you know, a shock at the same time because uh, relative, this was what most people considered. I mean, we won awards for this product. It was called Genius, Innovative, Amazing. You know, all of these buzzwords. And literally overnight, it was the devil wrapped in plastic, sort of <laughs> frankly. You know, it was single-use plastic and more single-use plastic. And I think customers became extremely aware of that and including myself, you know, the impact of that and what it has on the environment. And it really started with a, um, literally just a photo of a seahorse gripping a cotton bud. And within a week, the EU had banned them. Now, they gave us plenty of time to sell the stock through, but that wasn't really the issue. It was actually consumer perception that changed and flipped on its head. And so I made a really tough decision to phase it out ahead of the ban and really walk away from that product and try and bring new product development forward that I had planned to try and recover, essentially. So it was a really tough decision, but it was one that I think I was guided by my customers on. Now, over the years, we have seen candidates enter The Apprentice for various reasons. Some who genuinely want to go into business with large sugar, some who want to raise the profile of their business, and others who just enter for the fame. Which category (laughs) did you fall into? I for sure fall into the investment category. I, I was looking for a business partner, and actually, I'd never watched the show. My mum has, and... And it was a friend who sent the application to me and she said, Pam, 
this, you'd be amazing. And I thought, oh, God, no way. I like, couldn't do that. But then I did a bit of exploring and I looked at actually Lord Sugar's business investment. And I suppose to compare myself to one of his other investments, Susie Ma, she has a skincare company called Tropic Skincare. Uh, five years ago, he invested in her and they're turning over £22 million. So looking at those and the level of, I suppose he takes 50% and you can consider it giving away 50% or you can consider it he also takes 50% of the risk. So he's far more invested than, I suppose, your usual dragon's den type investor who has 10%, 20%. You know, there's far more risk for him. So he definitely immerses himself in these businesses, which is what attracted me. Now, the reason I've asked you that question is because, as you say, you appeared previously on Dragon's Den and you had turned down three offers of investment on the show. I did. It might seem crazy. And to be honest, at the time, it felt a bit crazy because I actually really needed the cash. Like we were kind of growing broke, you know, our lead time was three months. And at that stage, I was like, oh, yeah, money, that's what I need. And I took the offer of investment. You know, it was amazing on the show. They were so enthusiastic and it was brilliant. And during the time after the show, there's a bit of due diligence where obviously, you know, you delve a bit more into each other and they delve a bit more into me. So we had a couple of meetings arranged. But during these meetings, uh, one person didn't show to either. And I just had this feeling. I thought, oh, gosh, I mean, the no money's exchanged hands yet. Imagine when it does or if I'm trying to get money and I can't get a hold of them. It gave me this sense of, OK, maybe I don't need money that badly that I'm going to put myself in this situation. So, yeah, I decided to walk away. It wasn't an easy choice, but I think I made the right decision. And did the Dragons then prepare you in any way for The Apprentice? I would have liked to think so, but absolutely not. It's co- it's poles apart. Um, you go on to Dragon's Den, it's your business. You're almost standing behind your business, if you like. The Apprentice is the exact opposite. Your business is out the window for literally 10 weeks. Nobody knows what your business is. It's not discussed in the boardroom. You're there totally as a business person, and you're meant to shine through on these tasks that are essentially nothing related to what you do every day. And it's It's tough. Now, as viewers, we were glued to our screens for an hour every week and enjoyed the tasks, dramas, chaos and firings which are synonymous with the show. But what was your experience of The Apprentice actually like? You know what? It's fairly true to what you see. I mean, I probably the level of stress going into the boardroom, you know, win or lose, you, you don't know at that stage and you're going in and you're thinking, oh my God, because he's extremely intimidating. But at the same time, obviously I respect him a lot and he does command a presence when he walks into the room. But Lord Sugar is one of these people that just sends shivers down my spine. He terrifies <laughs> me. So I think probably the fear doesn't come across quite as much or I suppose the sleepless nights. Like obviously I have my own business and I pitch my own brand and that's what I do. And here I am pitching a toy and I've never felt stress like it. You know, it's just on another level. And looking back, what did you learn from the process that could benefit Moxie Loves going forward? There was a massive less, or lesson learned when I was doing the final or the final episode for me, which was the interview stage. And it was just feedback that I was getting from all the interview, interviewers. And it was really based around how my lack of product at that stage, which obviously hurt a little bit because I did have to discontinue too. And so it was fresh in my mind that that this was my Achilles heel almost. And here it is being pointed out. But the main thing that was pointed out to me was you just need to do another product. Like, what what are you waiting for? And I thought, yeah, do you know what? Whatever happens after this episode, I am going to bring out another product. And that I did. We launched it on Wednesday. Um, It's a dry shampoo sheet. So again, really focused on sustainability. It's eco-friendly, cruelty-free. All of the buzzwords that our customers are sort of looking and asking for at the moment. So yeah, I absolutely took that lesson home. Now this year we saw an eclectic mix of candidates on The Apprentice. What did you learn from your fellow candidates? You know, it's interesting. The one lesson I probably learned is that a team can be great. And being a solo entrepreneur, I think it is hard because you do spend so much time alone and you think, oh, no, I'm better at this than anyone. I know it better. And actually, sometimes when you share share your stress or share whatever you're doing that day, it can actually, a problem half, I suppose, is the problem. You know, it just feels like you can get more done. And it really encouraged me to want to build a team of good people. Um, it always has been on my hit list, but I think now even more so because I, I do miss that teamwork that we had. And how do you identify a niche in the market for new products? It's interesting because it, start, it sort of starts with looking at my everyday routine. I suppose from my point of view, I've been cleansed, toning and moisturising since a young age because of my mum. But 
I am not as into it as she is. So I'm always looking for a hack or a shortcut, if I can take one, without compromising on quality of, of my skincare routine or how my skin is after. So I'm always looking for how can I cut corners in my time, how long it takes me to do things. And so that's where, does this product save me time? Does it save me money? And is it easy to use? They're kind of my three things. And obviously now, after my lessons with sustainability and all of that, that is my first thing. Is it sustainable? Can it be a benefit to somebody without being hindrance on the environment? And that's kind of what I ask myself when I develop a product. What is the process for developing these new products? You know, they're all different and they all take different avenues. I think it always starts with the concept and the, pro- the product that's inside the packaging, if you will. And then after that, it's about well, does the packaging also solve the problem or is the packaging a hindrance? And then it, it goes from there and you sort of whittle it down. I mean, I've worked on products that have taken me a year. Some have taken me two years and some still are not as perfect as I'd want them to be. You know, I'm changing packaging all the time. Again, focusing on sustainability and how I can just improve. So I can tell you one thing, product development is time consuming, if nothing else. And you think you've got it right and then it arrives and it's wrong. And I um, have it's it's just a funny process because you never think it's going to take as long as it does, but it's the best part. It's the most fun, and it's definitely what I enjoy. And would that encourage you, then, as a consequence, to get involved maybe in the local chamber of commerce or business networking groups? Absolutely, and I actually have been involved in Going for Growth, which is a female entrepreneur program in Ireland, which is sponsored by Enterprise Ireland, and I found that extremely beneficial in the early days kind of being on my own but of course you only meet up once a month so it you know there is a need for something else and something more frequent so from that point of view absolutely i would look actually especially for more networking opportunities and final question regarding the apprentice last week with the final within touching distance lord sugar pointed his finger at you and said you're fired Mm. at this time were you very disappointed or had you achieved everything that you wanted from the process You know what? At that stage, quite honestly, I wasn't as disappointed as I thought I'd be. I sat there with two amazing candidates, both extremely successful, both like having established businesses. And I thought, you know, we're all on a par here. So if I go, it's not out of lack of merit. I didn't feel it was just maybe what types of businesses he potentially saw himself aligned with. And so I left and I thought, this is fine. I've learned so much about myself and I'm ready to put it into action. And you really, I suppose from my perspective, having done Dragon's Den, you really want your business partner or investor to be massively passionate because it's really that connection between the two of you is going to drive the business. So if Lord Sugar was hesitant in any way, I went at the perfect time because you really want someone who just wants it just the way you do. And I think that that's what makes a great business partnership. Do you think some of the business opportunities in the beauty space in the future will be to look at repackaging the product into more carbon-friendly packaging? Absolutely. I see that as a massive focus and a big shift in the industry. And, you know, if the bigger brands aren't ready and they don't have that set up, it's perfect for the likes of the independent brands like myself to really come into that space and disrupt it. Because if there's a similar formula, but it's in a more sustainable packaging or it's refillable or it takes any sort of box like that. You know, customers will make the move. They will make the switch. It's what's important to them. And if you can help somebody's carbon footprint when it comes to beauty, uh, c- customers are ready. They're looking for it. And Pamela, as you move forward with Moxie Loves, are you still looking for investment for the business? I am. I am. I'm really looking for the right business partner. Um, just to take it forward, obviously, we've got amazing launches coming and we've got, we're uh, going into Boots UK and, some other retailers and all of that require although it sounds great it does require a lot of investment and time and people and so yeah I'm absolutely still on the hunt for sure. What does the ideal business partner look like for you? For me it's definitely somebody with passion Um, of course it's not just the cash of you know even though that's definitely necessary for us to scale but I guess somebody who could tick the boxes that I don't of course I feel like I've got the innovation end of things sorted it's really about somebody with a good business head about how to scale what markets we target next because it's all just there in reach it's just about the process and how we how we make the next move and finally Pamela what is the long-term ambition for you and your business I mean there's a few of course I have my targets my wish list of stores you know Sephora Ulta that's the state, you know, Target, Australia, 
all of these big stores, um, because we're kind of an FMCG brand, you know, we want to be in those bigger stores. And that's my kind of short term goal. And I guess my long term goal is, you know, I do see an exit strategy. It's definitely how the beauty industry is going. It's much faster for the bigger businesses to buy in the innovation than it is to kind of incubate it in house. So from that perspective, I am aware as an independent brand, you can be quite valuable in kind of, I suppose, a seven year window. Uh, That would be kind of my long term goal. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Pamela Laird from Moxie Loves, and we wish her every success in securing investment for her business. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast.